You see, we can boast in many things in this life, right? But Paul's saying, don't boast in any of that. There's only one thing to boast in. It doesn't matter how successful you think you are in your own eyes. It doesn't matter what car you're driving. It doesn't matter what neighborhood you live in. It doesn't matter any of that stuff if you don't have this one thing right, if you don't have the main thing in perspective. All those other things, guess what? They're good things. Hallelujah. God gives them to us to enjoy. I'm not saying there's one thing wrong with those. I love having a nice car. I love having the the neighborhood that I live in. God is good, and he's been a blessing to me and my family and to many of yours as well. We're not supposed to scorn those things as long as we keep the main thing The main thing, the thing of first importance. See, Paul didn't see this as some cold formula. He lived the cross-centered life because the cross had saved him and transformed his own life. 30 years after his conversion, his heart still burned with the reality of God's holiness and his sinfulness. Listen to this. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly and in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. 30 years later, you'd think you'd have it all together. You'd think you wouldn't be looking back and reflecting on how blasphemous and what a sinner you were because you've been saved and now you're a saint, right? Everything's going good. You're not sinning anymore. You gave your life to Jesus Christ. None of you have sinned anymore after you gave your life to the Lord, have you? Any of you? You better have, if if y'all haven't sinned, I need you to get up and leave like right now because you are in the wrong church. We are in trouble. God saved us knowing that we were going to sin. Is it a license to sin? By no means, as we'll see. But this understanding, this thought process that he's going through needs to remain central in our life. I ask you another question. Do you still stand in awe of the mercy and forgiveness that you received in Christ Jesus? I mean, do you really understand the depth of the transforming grace that saved you, or do you brush your sin under the rug? Came here on Friday night. I shared with you earlier I was here for CR. A dear friend was here that night, and he gave a wonderful testimony, but there was a lot of bad parts to that testimony. You see, I knew this guy. I met him when I first moved to Jacksonville. We went to church together. At the time I met him, he had been sober for 15 years, about the same length of time that I've been sober right now. He was living a good life. He was attempting to live his life for Christ. He got into a relationship. The relationship broke and failed. As a result of that, he went out and he started drinking again. He forgot to run back the old self, the old person who he used to be, and for some reason he felt it acceptable to drink. It led him on a journey that lasted about seven or eight years where he almost came to the point of death. He described a day where he drove by my house. He was out there working and he drove by and I was taking the garbage out to the corner. And he had the courage that day. Previously, he didn't. He said he'd seen me at different places, but he had the courage that day, something God was doing in his heart. He said he was filled with shame. He was filled with guilt. He said he saw me coming out of the house, and he actually had, it was like 9 in the morning, he had a beer that was with him. The beer was sitting in the car. He said he draped the shirt over it so I couldn't see it. And he walked up, or I walked up to the car. David, man, I, I love you. How are you doing? I haven't seen you in a long time. You know, what's God doing in your life? He's, man. I'm hurting. I said, you know what? We got Easter services coming up. Why don't you just show up? I know you haven't been in a while. And he showed up and he described this story. And I know he doesn't care if I share it. He he told me I could share it. And he he described the story. He, He came to church and guess what? He came to church for six months and he was drunk every time and he didn't think anybody knew it. We knew it. We just kept loving on him and loving on him. He'd show up at CR. He'd go to group. He'd be drunk while he's in CR, right? He just showed up. He's drunk. Till one day somebody walked up and they looked him in the eyes. And if you knew him, you know his eyes were bloodshot beyond measure. And that woman said to him, I love you and your eyes look just like my daughter's did before she died. And he knew that her daughter had died from alcoholism. And he said, man, I can't go on anymore. I can't do this anymore. And he surrendered his heart and his will back to Jesus that day. And he said, Lord, would you help me? I can't go on doing this the same way that I've been doing. Man, he celebrated six months of sobriety this past week. And God is up to something special in his life. And he's actually, I think it was eight months. Just amazing that God had transformed his life. But guess what? He had to remember to run the tapes back. You see, when I got sober some 15 years ago, we still had VHS tapes. Some of you young people don't know what that is. We had VHS tapes. 
They came after Betamax tapes that didn't last very long, if you know the history of tape. You know. But they would tell us frequently, you've got to run the tapes back. And they were actually telling us something that was very biblical in nature, and they maybe didn't even know it. See, what happens is we've got to remember just how sinful we are, where we came from, just how much God saved us from, because if we forget we will fall right back into that which was natural for us before we got saved. So for me, it maybe is a journey to South Florida, and I'd go to South Florida about a year or two ago, and I went down there, and we would drive around, and there were certain places that had wonderful memories, and I'd be like, yes, I remember being there that day. I remember the good things that happened, but there was also a lot of memories where I look back, oh my gosh, I can't believe what I did in that place. I can't believe how I behaved. I can't believe what I had said to that other person. I can't believe how I was living at that time. Lord, I can't believe how much I need you. And were the depth of the darkest moments of my life, like the depth of the moments of the cross, filled with bloody, nasty, terrible things, somehow turns into a moment of hope as our lives are transformed. But if we forget this message of first importance, let me tell you, we'll go on living for ourselves. We'll keep revolving the world around us when in fact the world should revolve around the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and what he did in your life. See, we need to understand the depth of our own sinfulness so that we can appreciate just how much God loves us and what he saved us from so that we can experience the joy and awe and wonder of the Christian life. If you're not experiencing the joy and awe and wonder of the Christian life, you forgot where you came from, people. Because some of you were sick, and I know it. (laughs) See, some of us are sicker than others. You'll get that in a minute. Some of you getting that yet? Some of us are sicker than others, but guess what? All of us are sick to some degree or another because we live in this sin-stained, fallen world, and we're in need of a Savior, the Savior who the Bible is talking about here today as we share. So before I close today, I want to remind us of God's wrath towards sin and how sinful we are apart from Him and how awesome it is to be saved We're going to dwell on Romans chapter 3, 21 through 26. It's the centerpiece of Christian theology. But before we do, I'll give you just a little bit of background and history on it. How the cross message not only is about our salvation, but about our life transformation. We're going to talk about a set of verses that Martin Luther calls the chief point and very central place of the epistle to the Romans and of the whole Bible. It's the central message of the cross. The verses that we're about to read come after a long analysis by the Apostle Paul from verse 118 through 320 that basically make the point that you and I are damned. We are destined to a life apart from God. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. There's nothing that we can do in our good works that'll be good enough to get us into heaven. It starts with some very, very, very bad news. You better hope that you keep reading on to verse 320 because if you stop early, you are going to be in trouble. So you need to continue to read it in context and read it on through because he's basically making the point that each of us, you and I, apart from a relationship with Christ, because of our sinful nature, it's called the doctrine of total depravity. That you and I are jacked up, we are messed up, our every thought is selfish apart from him. And until he touches our life and changes us and transforms us, we are destined to an eternity apart from God, an eternity in hell. We all need a Savior. Aren't you glad we have a Savior today, right? So he starts off this message with some really bad news. Romans 1.18, the wrath of God revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. See, we all have a tendency, as Paul is laying out this evidence of our sinfulness, we all want to suppress the real truth about our sin. Even as I'm reading this today, you're wanting to say, not me. I don't live that way. I didn't live that way. My life doesn't center around me. What are you talking about, Eric? But I'm here to tell you that in reality, if you're willing to be honest and you're willing to let it sink in, you'll notice all these nooks and crannies that you haven't surrendered to God. But if you'll surrender them to him, let me tell you, he'll fill them with life and love and hope and peace and freedom and joy. You won't have a desire to sin any longer. You see, what happens is when we try to live under the law and we try to live under our own righteousness, we find ourselves falling short. 
And when you start to fall short, you start to feel inadequate and you can't realize that you're even saved anymore because you're trying to live under your own righteousness. And many of us live to serve God and we go out there and we try to do all the right things and what traditional Christianity teaches you is a list of do's and don'ts. If you do these things and don't do these things, then you're going to be okay. And if you want to be a strong believer in Jesus Christ, here's what you have to do. If you're a man, you need to get into an accountability group. And after you get in the accountability group, ladies, y'all need to get up every single morning. You need to read the word for 15 minutes. If you don't do your daily devotionals, then you're going to be in trouble, right? If you don't pray a certain amount of time, then guess what? See, but if you put all these different spiritual disciplines into practice in your life, then guess what? You will grow in your walk and your relationship with Christ. You know, it's actually backwards because what happens is if you put those things first and you don't get the love and grace and understanding of who he is, then you're going to fall short because there's going to be a morning where you are tired and you hit the snooze bar on the alarm and you don't get to read the word that day and you're going to be like, oh my gosh, my life is coming to an end. I feel disconnected from my relationship with God. Where if you start to realize just how much he loves you, then all of a sudden those have-tos become get-tos and want-tos. Like that relationship that you had with someone you love, maybe now or in the past. You remember what it was like. If they would have walked up to you and said, you better call me every morning. If we're going to date, you better call me every morning. I better get that phone call by 8 o'clock. If I don't get that phone call by 8 o'clock, then you're not going to be my friend anymore. That relationship probably didn't last very long, right? 